Well, uh, if, uh, if you're going to follow along in your Bible, uh, we're, we're going to do like we did last week. We're going to bounce around a little bit, but we'll start in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible, so it's, it's kind of easy to find, but uh, it's, it's right there at the front. We, we're in the series uh, called Find the Melody, uh, and what we're kind of looking for is like all these different seasons of life that we go through. You and I, uh, we just sang a song. That, that you are my rescue, that Jesus is our rescue. And so if we're needing a rescue, then we might say, hey, I'm kind of in a low spot right now. I'm in a valley. I need rescue. And what we've been just sort of admitting is like, hey, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about worshiping Jesus in the valleys, in the, in the valley of the shadow of death, that he's there. You can worship Jesus in the worst moments of life. It's possible. You can worship Jesus in the best moment. You are having the best day right here. You just won the lottery. Um, congratulations. Uh, the offering box is in the back. Uh, dumb preacher jokes. Uh, you, you're, you're having the greatest day ever. And it's like, well, can you worship Jesus? Well, of course you can. Um, and the this idea of find the melody is that over the course of all of creation, over all of scripture, it just seems like the Lord is just kind of hitting the same notes over and over again. If you think of it like music, it's just these same four or five notes. Um, and then our greatest satisfaction, our ability to live in harmony with that, our greatest source of peace will be to identify those notes and then to play our part that we're called to play in those notes. And you have two choices in, in life. Uh, I guess three. You can, you know, the third choice is just like, I don't know what you're talking about, Jesse. I'm ignorant of all those things. That's, that's, that's a choice. If you know this, then you, you have two choices. You have... You have the ability to worship God in the season that you're in right now. The best of it, the worst of it, the, the, the beauty of it, the ugly of it, the grief of it, the awesome of it, whatever it is. You can choose to worship him now and live in harmony with what the Lord is doing. Or you can choose to live your own life. You can make your own decisions and you can make it about you or about something else. Um, and, and you get whatever you earn with that. My experience personally has been whenever I got off beat, when I got off the melody, um, I found a lot of discontentment in my life. I, I lost immense amounts of joy. The greatest sources of joy I found in my life is that despite what was going on around me circumstantially, despite what season I was in, I just found what the Lord was doing. And I just just kind of leaned into that a little bit. And then there's peace and then there's rest. And so this series, we've been doing this for several weeks now. We're in week five uh, and we've just looked at different seasons. Last week, we looked at just seasons of marriage and singleness and widowhood and multi-marriage. And like, we just looked at all different things around marriage and singleness because that's a predictable season that you can go through. This week, I want to look at another predictable season that people go through. Um, if you are a child, you're in a predictable season of Childhood, And if you are a parent, you're in a predictable season of parenting. And if you're an empty nester, that's, a, that's another predictable season. Uh, I just want to look at this whole season around parenting and empty nesting and just see, like, what is the melody in that? How can we worship the Lord in that? And as, as I move forward, I just want to admit there's a lot of different flavors of the parenting season, right? Uh, my, my family, we're in the parenting season of I have one kid uh, supposed to start kindergarten, uh, and we'll find the date that that will start soon. And then we have another kid who just started middle school. That's, that's messing our life up. If you rewind the clock back, <laughs> that, that got you? All of you were like, yeah, sixth graders. Whew. Uh, if you rewind the clock back far enough, there was a season of parenting where we had a bunch of diapers in the house. And if you fast forward the clock a great deal, then there's going to be a season of parenting where I'm like, uh, see you around Thanksgiving, I guess. Uh, and then, and then he'll leave. Uh, my children will leave. There's, there's all these different flavors of parenting. There's, there's two parent parenting homes. There's single family homes. There's uh, blended family homes. There's foster homes. That's a whole other kind of parenting, but, but still it's a parenting itself is a predictable season. Empty nest. Empty nest is, it's a different way of thinking things, but just like parenting, there's a lot of different flavors of it. There's, there's the empty nest of, hey, we're just a young couple and we haven't had children yet. There's the empty nest of, uh, we're, we're choosing to, to hold off on having children. It's a choice that we're making. There's the empty nest of, hey, my kids have all graduated, and my house is a lot quieter than what it was. There's the empty nest. <laughs> Bradley, your house is not quiet ever. <laughs> uh, there's the empty nest of uh, losing a child. There's the empty nest of infertility. There's a lot of different flavors of empty nesting. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that a lot of the empty nest flavors have a lot of grief and sorrow attached to them, a lot of mourning. And what I want to look at today, what I want to hope that we are kind of equipping ourselves for as just a church family is whatever season of parenting or empty nesting we find ourselves 
ourselves in, it is possible to find the melody uh, or to get away from the metaphor. It's possible to worship God in that moment. It's possible to grow through that moment. It's possible to learn new things about your Lord Jesus that are only accessible to you in that season. And for some of you, it's such a unique season um, that there's not a lot of people around you that have gone through that or will go through that. You have the most unique perspective of the Lord Jesus uh, of anybody. And we as a church are better if we bring all of that to the table. And so if you would, uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit. I want to look in Deuteronomy uh, together and just kind of start discussing parenting a little bit. It turns out, uh, as you would probably suspect, uh, God's a big uh, fan of you know, families and growth and parenting. He uses, I mean, we call him father, for goodness sake. He, he uses familial language to identify himself to us. Um, and so parenting is vital to how we understand the gospel and how we understand the Lord. In chapter six of Deuteronomy, uh, there's this passage of scripture that uh, if you're Jewish or grew up Jewish, it's called the Shema. We talked about this maybe a year ago as a church. We looked at the Shema. Uh, Shema is a Hebrew word, means hear and so the first word is here. It's just it's just this passage. Um, if you grew up uh, if you grew up uh, Catholic or Lutheran or some of the more liturgical uh, expressions of Christianity, uh, and you remember uh, uh, saying the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, you memorize that at a young age. Is that resonating with anybody? Some of us we did that. Um, the Lord's Prayer was something that we teach children and we memorize it and we use it throughout our growth. The Shema is like the Jewish version of that. It's something that was taught at a very young age to remind them of what a key important element was. And it was meant to grow with children, not just as a child as they learn it, but grow all the way into when they become parents as well. That as they grew and understood the Shema and the implications of that, they would apply it. So let's read the Shema together. We also reference this every time we do a child dedication here at Carpenter's Way. <clears throat> Deuteronomy is uh, the last book that Moses writes. And so this is uh, Moses writing He's a, as an old man trying to tell the Jewish people like, hey, here, here's what you need to know. Here, verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is a key instruction both in the Old and New Testament. This is how we are to love the Lord our God. And then he starts to unpack this some. He says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your lips. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Rewind to verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children who... Who is responsible for teaching the youngest child in the clan, in the tribe, in the, in the community? Who, who's responsible for teaching the ch youngest children the truths of who God is? The ways of God, that he is one God, and that we're to love him with everything we've got. Who's responsible according to Moses? Is it, is it the temple? Is it the church? Is it the hired pastor who comes in from far away? Is it the children's pastor's primary responsibility? The primary responsibility in the home of teaching children about the ways of God is not the organization outside of the family. It is the parents. It is mom and dad's responsibility to teach them about God. And here's, here's the great news. You don't, you don't even have to try. The way that you live your life and the way that you talk, your actual thoughts and feelings about God will be transferred to your kids, whether you mean to or not. Um, it's better to have your hand on the wheel as a parent, can we agree? And not just like in anger, we say something and our kids learn a thing about God. Um, the, the primary responsibility of teaching about God and his ways and what he's like, it falls on, on us uh, to, to do. Uh, so parenting is, is vital. It's the way that the message of God carries on. Um, if you are a follower of Jesus today, I just, wanna, I just want you to consider this important fact. If you're a follower of Jesus today, um, it's because somebody told you about him. Zero people in here woke up and you were just so smart. You're like, you know what? This world is devastatingly broken. I, I think God sent a rescuer about 2,000 years ago. I'm going to put my faith in him. Nobody came up with those conclusions by themselves. It only happens because someone, uh, Paul would use family language. He was like a dad of the faith. He, he's like, as a dad, I taught you the ways of Jesus. Um, you know what you know about God because you're 
older generation told you about it. So the responsibility falls on uh, Psalms uh, 103. I want to turn there quickly. And just look at this, that, that uh, what we know about parenting, um, the, the, whole, the whole action of parenting, is meant to teach us a little bit about who God is and what he's like, what his character is. Psalm 103, verse 13 says this. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Now, we, I could have used... Uh, honestly, two dozen verses to make this one point. The way that we are as parents to our children transfers to what our children think about God the Father. Um, many people that I talk to, they have a very difficult time understanding the things of faith because their dad was kind of a monster. Their, 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 their parents were jerks. Uh, my, my, uh, uh, my recovering social work had, you know, as, as a foster worker, I would walk into homes and these children, their thoughts about how cruel and punishing God was. I'm like, well, that's, that doesn't reflect the God of the Bible. You know who that reflects, though. And I wouldn't say this to anybody's face, but it helps me understand where they're coming from. This reflects your parents. This reflects what, what you grew up in. We, we, whether we like it or not, we live in a created order in which the Lord chooses to use family units to demonstrate and to display his character onto children. And if we do it right, we prepare our children for when they're adults to have a robust faith in the Father. Um, if, if, we, if we mess up, if we're flawed, or something else gets in the way, it, it, has, um, it has a negative effect, but they're not, they're not impossible to overcome. I'm, my only point here is, the Lord uses families and children, the, the, the relationship between parents and children, to show his compassion and what he's like. A few more verses about parenting, then I want to get to empty nesting because there's a lot of, of grief in that that I want to address. Psalm 127, if you were here in the uh, back to school prayer night, we referenced this. Uh, it uses this imagery of like children are like arrows getting launched around. How cool would that be? My, like dads, I, I don't know. My, my wife is super sweet and gentle. Like if my children have a boo-boo, I am useless, okay? My kids will stump their toe. They will run around me to get to mom. But if they want to like get thrown onto a bed from 50 feet away, I'm their guy. Like I'm dad, let's go. And you just like, you sling a kid into a pool. It's so much fun as a dad. Uh, I, think, I think David uh, or whoever wrote this psalm kind of agrees with us. Uh, Psalm 127 says, um, verse uh, 4, excuse me, verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. They're a gift. They're precious. Uh, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children uh, of one's youth. This, this imagery, one, is really fun. Like, I'm going to launch my kid across. Um, but it's an imagery of time and, and legacy. Uh, moms and dads, listen real quick. You are launching into the next generation, your children, with the skills that you provided them with, with the discipline that they have, the, the well-roundedness, their manners, their whatever, their, even their politics. I mean, everything about them, you are steering and you have some say in that until they turn about 12 or 13 and then they do exactly the opposite. Listen, that's normal. That's, that's just part of child development. It's also a way of them to test if you are true. If you give them time, uh, more often than not, they come back. But at the end of your job as parents, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, you're gonna cock that bow back and you launch it. Unless you're Australian, then it's a boomerang, and they come back and they live in your house in their 20s, in their 30s. Uh, but then you're launching them into the future. Um, your relationship, uh, you'll get a little bit of this next week. I won't, I won't ruin uh, next week's message. But uh, your relationship with your children when they are adults is very different, and you've launched something into the future. What, what, have, you, what have you launched? See, so, so much of parenting is exhausting. Uh, I say this as one who's exhausted. Uh, I say this as one who is, as like, I, I, a month would go by, and I'm like, have I even seen my kids lately? You know those commercials that used to come on when we were kids? Like, do you know where your children are? I'm like, we, why don't we have that commercial anymore? Because sometimes I'm like, are they even? Oh, they're still on YouTube, okay. Um, 
after Hurricane Harvey, uh, Max, my youngest, was being born during Hurricane Harvey. I've shared this multiple times, but we left the hospital. And then, and then for like three months, I didn't even like meet the kid. I, basically, I walked in, and he was just sitting at the table, and I shook hands like, hi, I'm your father. Uh, <laughs> that's a, a bit of an exaggeration, but there was just so much time lost as I'm working on the house with my youngest son. And here, here's, here's what happens. If we're not careful, moms, dads, if we're not careful... We're so tired from work, we're so tired from the stress, and then social media and all the schools and everything's just stressing us out. Then a month goes by and six months goes by, a year goes by. We didn't have our hand on the wheel during that time, and we're launching something into the future, but did we launch what we wanted? Were we there for our children? There's an organization uh, called Orange, uh, a guy named Reggie Joyner, and he says it's just a phase. Everything is just a phase. There's an entire line of books. Of, it's the just a phase book. You can go online. You can look at this. Uh, actually, you may want to order some of them. They're, they're really, really good. It's just a phase. That, that diaper mode, just a phase. Um, that middle school angry mode, awkward, just a phase. That, that angry teenager storming around, it's just, it's just a phase. And we spend so much of our energy just trying to get to the next phase because we think, like, it's going to fix it. But we got to put our hands on the wheel today. We have, to, we, have to, we have to honor this season that the Lord has called us to today. Um, Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs 22, 6. This is a famous proverb. You probably don't even have to have ever read the Bible to know this proverb. Uh, uh, proverb 22, 6. I want to read it, and then I want to explain it because it's usually uh, taught wrongly. Proverbs uh, 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Raise your hand if you've heard that verse before. Yeah? Yeah, it's a great verse. It ends up on like mugs, like I'm a dad. Raise up a child in the way he should go. Like you just hold up the mug and it, it just says, Raise up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Most often this is taught as moms and dads teach your children well so that you're raising them up the way that they should go, the, the morally and high ethics and knowing the ways of the Lord. And, and those are all great lessons. Uh, we should do that. That's what Deuteronomy's point was, that we should teach them a way of the Lord. Uh, but that's not what this verse is actually talking about. This is not talking about morals and ethics. This is an archery term, just like the last one was. That phrase, um, in the way he should go. Oh, let me, let me back up just a second. Uh, I wonder if, if I'm not going to do a show of hands, but I think I could probably find some parents that they raised up multiple children. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, but kids are, they're not robots. They, they all have a personality of their own. Um, and then you've got like the one who like, they're on the straight and narrow. And then one who's just like, I'm going to go burn some things and go commit felonies. Like they just, they just like you, you as a mom and dad, you did your best. You did your, your, your best. If, if this verse were about teaching them the ways of God and they won't depart from it, then all of you parents should be scratching your head. Like, why didn't this verse apply to me? Uh, because I'm, I'm really like my adult child really breaks my heart right now. And I, I miss him or I miss her. Um, that phrase, uh, in the way he should go, is an archery term. They, uh, they, they didn't have factories, so somebody would have to go make a bow, and there would be a master bow maker, and bows are made out of yeah, manufactured polymers. No, uh, they're made out of wood, uh, sticks, and uh, they're not compound bows. And so you, you would have this master bow maker that the king would hire. He worked for the kingdom, he worked for the military, and he would go out in the forest, and he would find the perfect tree with the perfect branch, with the perfect length. It was a certain tree and a certain branch and a certain length that is perfect for bows. He is the master bow maker, and he knows what he's looking for. And he goes, and he... He snaps that stick off, and he takes it back home, and he's got to make this bow. Now, you and I, uh, I, I, have you ever tried to make a bow? I, I did as a kid. I grabbed a stick. I broke it. I put some string on it. I launched an arrow. It was cool. It launched that first time. And then the second time, man, it kind of went squirrely. The third time, the thing snapped. It just didn't work out for me because I don't know the right stick, and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I used to have a wood deck on my back porch that was built before I bought the house, and uh, the planks were all perfect except for this one section. They would start all overlapping because if you've worked with wood, you know that wood has a certain way that it turns. It has a crown. It has a bow on it. Am I right? Any carpenters in here? I, I, we got carpenters. Uh, and a skilled carpenter, before he puts that first nail in it, He's going to look at it. I was like, which way is this board bending? Okay, it's already bending that way. I'm going to bend it that way. I'm going to, I'm going to put it where it goes. I'm going to make sure that all the bends are going the same way. An unskilled carpenter is like, I don't care. The carpenters that, that came to my house and did some work, I don't care. And they lay it down, and it just, it all overlaps. The, the bow maker, he would look at that stick, and he'd look at the grain of it first, and he'd size it up. He'd let it dry out for a minute. 
and you'd see it was already starting to lean this one way, I'm going to take it, I'm going to finish, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to, I'm going to bend it in the way it should be going and finish the bend. I'm going to make the perfect bow that's going to last this archer generation after generation, battle after battle, it's going to work. The unskilled bow maker just snaps the thing in half and doesn't know what he's doing. What this verse is actually teaching, moms and dads, listen, what this verse is actually teaching is raise up a ch- train up a child in the way he should go. That is, you and I, as parents, should look at our children and just know that God gave them a personality, traits, gifts, talents, and they're unique to this child. And we could do one of two things. Teachers could, could vouch for this, by the way. Uh, you, we have one of two choices. We can force the child into our image of what the perfect child is, or we can just understand, I've got a busy child. And so let me help bend this child, use that energy and that busyness in a way that is God-honoring and isn't going to cause him felonies later. Uh, oh, I have, I have a child who's kind of, you know, likes to read and does these things. I would be a terrible father if I took this child who likes to read and like, listen here, little Billy, you're going to go out and play football now. I don't care. And like, he's just like, I'm not that kid, Dad. I'm not that kid. Parents who force their children to be a kid that they're not are snapping the bows. But parents who pause and look at their children and say, which way is this child leaning and how can I help them honor the Lord, honor the Father in that moment? I'm going to bend them in the right direction. Train up a child in the way he should go is a task for moms and dads, not to teach morals, but to understand how our Lord has wired our children and then to bend them in that direction. And then uh, last, last thing uh, on parenting, Ephesians 6, uh, all the way in the New Testament, uh, Ephesians, uh, just like so many of the books that we looked at last week, just has a lot of family code at the end. And I just want to look at a few verses of family code at the end of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 1 is every parent's favorite verse. Children, obey your parents. And then we close the Bible and like, we have now completed our devotional for the evening, kids. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Listen, if, if you were a child, um, your Lord has chosen your parents. He put you in that family. Um, he knew what he was doing, and it is your job, it is our job, to obey our parents for it is right. Honor your father and mother. He's now quoting one of the Ten Commandments, right? And then he adds some explanation to honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Now, he's saying, it's not, it's not the first commandment, of course, but it's the first commandment with a promise. He's, he's saying there's a little benefit to you, kids. Uh, if you honor your mom and dad, if you obey your mom and dad, there's some benefit. There's a promise if you do it. You do this as a way of worshiping the Lord so that, verse 3, it may go well with you in the land. Oh, excuse me, it will go well with you and you may live long in the land. The promise, listen, kids, is that you have a peaceful life. You guys guys want peace, right? All the the kids are like, listen, man, you're stepping on my toes, don't tell me. Like, listen, uh, we want peace, you want peace. A surefire way to get peace is to honor mom and dad. Okay, Jesse, but my mom and dad, they're they're drug addicts, okay. Uh, My mom and dad aren't there, okay. My mom and dad, you know, there's all these different ways of making a family. It is possible to honor your mom and dad, even if they're just not there, if they're terrible. Um, I say this as, uh, again, being in foster homes, talking to kids who were taken away from mom and dad, and they were angry at mom and dad. He always does this. I try to get him to stop. He wouldn't stop. I hate my dad. The, the, the bad parenting is like, yeah, let's all hate your dad together. The good parenting is to help them, train them up in the way they should go. You know what we should do? We should honor mom and dad in this moment. Listen, I I think mom and dad may just be sick and just need a little help. Um, They're they're going to the doctor around. The number of times uh, a mom and a dad were in jail or in rehab, and I just told their kids that they're getting some help at the doctor. I, I can't tell you how many times. It wasn't meant to be a lie. It was meant to be explaining to a child in a way that they could understand. Because I want them to know you can still honor them even when they're sick. But let's keep going. Then it may go well with you. Uh, you may live long in the land. Fathers, verse 4, and this will be moms and dads for that matter. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Again, it's our job, moms and dads, to teach our children about the Lord. Um, provoking children to anger is a surefire way to get short-term goals and long-term ills. Uh, if you don't believe me, go check out any Little League soccer, Little League football, Little League baseball right now. Just go to whatever sport is happening right now. And you're going to see these dads like just tearing into their kid. I told you, you run, you do this. And they get angry. The kids get angry. And then they perform that day. 
They, perform, they get the job done. They've been provoked to anger, but then they carry that the next day and the next day. There's far better ways for us to steer our children than full-on anger. Um, we teach them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What, whose discipline and instruction? Of, of the Lord. You know, one of the, the, the um, tasks of a mom and dad is to uh, discipline and instruct our children the same way that the Lord has disciplined and instructed us. The Lord has been patient with you, hasn't he? He's, he's been kind. He's been gentle. He's, he's met you where you're at. Uh, he didn't ignore you. Uh, he disciplines those whom he loves. Yay, love that verse. Uh, he, he hasn't given up on you either. And so when we moms and dads instruct our children, when we discipline our children, we do it the same way that the Lord has disciplined us and instructed us. Let me, let me switch gears. And I just want to talk to empty nesters. And again, like I said at the top, um, there's a lot of different kinds of empty nesters. There's those who are like really excited about it. And then there are those who are like, I've got a lot of heartbreak for this. Be, be, be careful, Jesse. I just I want to make a couple of observations from Scripture. Um, one, uh, in terms of infertility, uh, the story of infertility, the, the ingredient of infertility is used in every redemptive story of the Bible. I don't think that's hyperbole. It's like from beginning to end, Sarah was barren until she was 100, and then the Lord did a thing. Um, uh, uh, oh, shoot. Um, uh, Samuel's uh, mom, I can't think of her name, uh, you know, infertility, infertility. Uh, John the Baptist's mom, infertility. There's infertility all the way through here. And so I just, I just want to say that there's a way to worship the Lord and a glimpse you can get of the Lord um, in that season that is unique only to you. Psalm 147, verse 3. I've used this so many, so many times. Tears, people devastated. The, you, I've, I've been in moments, uh, I, I did a funeral once for a child. Uh, the child was about six months old, and mom and dad are just devastated. They woke up one day, and, and their baby was gone. And they're like, well, what does this mean? Like, I, don't, I don't know that it means anything. I'm, I have no words. You, you, you hire the pastor. You're like, pastor, say, say like something that fixes all this. There's, you're, that's devastating. I am so heartbroken for you. Here's, here's what scripture says about being brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted. Another verse will say he's close to the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Every family I've ever talked to with deep grief, but in terms of just empty nesting, infertility with deep grief, I just, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, in those moments of heartbreak, the Lord is closer to you then than maybe you've ever experienced. Um, and he will bind up your wounds. What we want is for the wounds to go away. And he makes the wounds disappear and erases them from history. That would be the awesomest way to end that verse and make it true. Except that everybody who's lost a child can tell you the wound is still there. Um, but he binds up the wounds. It's a type of thing that it's a grief that you go through that once you go through, you never, you're never healed from it, I don't think. I don't think you ever like wake up like, man, I haven't even thought about that grief for a while. It's something you carry with you forever and ever, but a, a binded up, bandaged up version of that is, is, is this glimpse into the ways of the Lord in a season of life that you carry with you. Um, I would also add to that the hope of faith the hope of Christian faith is that this existence is the temporary one. This momentary life is just going to be but a vapor. This momentary glimpse of suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Those are the hopes of Scripture. And so what do we do now? We trust that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he heals the brokenhearted, and he's going to bind up those wounds. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter five, Jesus is kind of telling everybody like, let me tell you really how the kingdom works. I, I love, I love the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I reference it quite a bit. I would really, if I could, I would just preach Sermon on the Mount, finish it, and then start over. It's just, it, it's that good. Uh, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he's just going through all these different things that you need to know that you are blessed in these moments. And they're all backwards. They're all the things that we don't want. Blessed are you when you win the lottery. That's what we want him to say, but he says other things. Uh, blessed are you when you're poor in spirit. Like, that's, that's one of them. But verse 4, chapter 5, verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn. That's terrible. 
You know, we're in a world where mourning is possible, grieving is possible. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Again, the same message is there, that, that there's a, a way that the Lord comforts those who are mourning, that those who have never experienced mourning and grief will never know, they will never experience. Um, I also think I just made up a season of life that you will never experience mourning and grieving. Can, can we just all agree that it's universal, that humans are going to suffer, there's going to be grieving, there's going to be mourning? So what do we do with that? Um, the world has trained us, and unfortunately, many of the churches have trained us. In those seasons, you can't worship God then. You've got to worship God later when you get back to it. Uh, Jesus says the opposite. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Last, last passage I want to look at, Psalm 37. I know I went Old Testament, New Testament. We're, we're doing our Bible sword drills today. If you've been around church in like, you know, since you were five, you know what that is. Psalm 37, verse 5. What do we do? What do we do when, when none of this makes sense? What do we do yeah, when, when we're empty nesting, there's a lot of grief attached to it? What do we do when our kids are now adults and they can do whatever they want? Uh, what do we do when, when we're sad, when we're trying to navigate this, when, when none of this makes sense and we realize we have no control over it? Verse 5, 37 verse 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. See, this is, this is where we're getting to the, that little word that we call faith. We, we trust the Lord's ways. We're just going to commit to him. I don't know what to do with this season, Jesse. Commit your way to the Lord. Okay, how can I trust the Lord right now? How can I worship him right now? Trust in him, and he will act. Verse 6, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Whatever season of grief you're in, and especially if it's around family and, and empty nesting, um, trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. Commit your way to him. And what he's going to do, he's going to work it out in such a way that brings forth your righteousness as the light. And in this season, we'll look at more seasons as the series goes on, but the season of parenting and empty nesting, we, we would be wise to start to look for the melody in that. How do you worship the Lord right now in this unique moment that is available to you in this one season? Um, how, do you, how do you see the Lord now? How do you worship him now? And how can you grow right now? Wherever you are on this spectrum of parenting, available to you today, right now, is a unique glimpse at the heart of the Father. What is he wanting you to know about him? What, 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 do you, what do you know about the Father? I mean, we call him the Father. I miss my, I miss my dad. What, what does the Heavenly Father want you to know? I had a great dad. What does the Heavenly Father want you to know about that? I had a terrible dad. What does the Heavenly Father want you to know about that? Uh, I am a great father. What does the Heavenly Father want you to know about that? I am a terrible father. What does the Heavenly Father want you to know about that? Wherever you are as a parent, you catch glimpses of your Heavenly Father in ways that are so unique and precious and should be treasured. The number of times where, as a dad, I'm looking at my children and I say or do a thing, and then I take a step back and I just think, maybe I'm animated, maybe it's a discipline, maybe it's hilarious, maybe it's something silly, I don't know. It's, it's all the things of parenting. I just, I just think, like, I think the Lord looks at me that way. I think the Lord has told me, you know, Jesse, I've said it now 10 times. Now you're going to time out. You know, like I've said this as a dad. Like how many times has he said this to me? These are glimpses of our heavenly father that are just unique to you. When, when our heart is broken for whatever reason that parenting or empty nesting causes it, like what is the glimpse of the father? I had a friend tell me one time that she, she, had, she had lost a child and uh, she was telling me kind of how she processed it. And she said, uh, I know that my heavenly father knows what it's like to lose his child too. It's like, wow, I would have never, whoa. There is a glimpse of the Lord right now in your parenting or empty nesting, in the joys of it and in the griefs of it that are unique to you. Find the melody and worship him in that. Let me pray, and then uh, we will be dismissed. One, one word I, I, I got distracted in the welcome is uh, uh, if you have a child in the children's ministry, which is first through fifth grade, there's a parent meeting today at 2 o'clock. Uh, there's this. Your kids will come home with this. Uh, you, can, you can do that. Let me pray. Father, uh, this morning <clears throat> we come to you uh, in whatever season uh, so many of us are in, and just, just trust that you're a good father. Um, 
you are a father who knows what we need. You know how to guide us. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for, first of all, for those of us who uh, kind of are in a season of hurt, grief, confusion. Um, Lord, I, I pray that you'll be close, uh, that, that those uh, who are in that would sense you, that you would bind up those wounds as your word says. Um, I pray, Father, that they would catch glimpses of your heart and your love and your care for them, your pursuit of them as they, um, as they process that. Lord, I pray for uh, others that as, as, we, as we raise kids and just navigate it, that we keep our hands on the wheel, that we do not get distracted, we don't get overwhelmed, and in that process, we just catch glimpses of you. I pray blessings over the homes that are represented in this room and uh, who will be hearing this. I pray that you'll be uh, a source of peace and comfort to, to all of those. Uh, Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.